Hey everyone, I'm Black Lightning. Should we practice eugenics? I'm going to talk about eugenics first, then gene or genome editing. Eugenics, for those who don't know, is the science of improving a human population by controlled breeding to increase the occurrence of desirable heritable characteristics. It was developed largely by Francis Galton, who seemed to have been influenced by his cousin Charles Darwin as a method of improving the human race, but many people opposed to it because the Nazis attempted to practice eugenics, and we saw how that went. They wanted a superior Aryan race. Eugenics should be about improving the quality of human beings, rather than for racist or other discriminating ideologies. Wait, what about what came before this? How did we know that traits can be passed down from parents to offspring? Sure, we could look at the phenotype of the organism and pretty much say that the child will look like the parents. But when did our genotype come into focus? I'll start with the man known as the father of genetics, Gregor Mendel. He worked on pea plants and discovered the fundamental laws of inheritance, the law of segregation, the law of independent assortment, and the law of dominance. He deduced that genes come in pairs and are inherited as distinct units, one from each parent. His genetic experiments took him eight years and he published his results in 1865. At the time, no one appreciated his work and it wasn't until some time after his death when his work was finally understood. Even though most of his work didn't hold up, they did lead to testable predictions. His work wasn't all for naught after all. Speaking of predictions, I'm going to talk about Punnett squares. The Punnett square is a diagram that is used to predict an outcome of a particular cross or breeding experiment. It was named after Reginald C. Punnett. It's used by biologists to determine the probability of an offspring having a particular genotype. I'm going to talk about the different patterns of inheritance. The first pattern is complete dominance. A monohybrid crosses when one trait is considered, and a dihybrid crosses when two traits are considered. An example of a monohybrid cross would be this. We have a man and a woman who are both heterozygous, which means there's a capital E and a lowercase e. Homozygous would mean the genotype will have both capital letters or both lowercase letters. In this example, brown eyes is dominant to the expression of blue eyes. The capital E will represent brown eyes and the lowercase e will represent blue eyes. Since they are both heterozygous, the mother and the father have brown eyes. If there is at least one capital letter in the genotype, the dominant trait will be expressed. So I'm going to fill out the pundit square and use this to predict the genotype and phenotype of their children. I'm going to say big and little e instead of capital and lowercase e to speed things up. There's a 25% of the genotype of big E, big E, a 50% chance for the genotype big E, little e, and a 25% for the genotype little e, little e. The phenotype will be different. The children have a 75% of being born with brown eyes and a 25% of being born with blue eyes. Remember, if a dominant allele is present, the dominant trait will always be expressed in the phenotype. A dihybrid cross is more complex. This is when two traits are being considered, so expect a bigger Punnett square. Let's say rolling your tongue is dominant to not being able to roll your tongue, and a widow's peak is dominant to a straight hairline. Rolling your tongue will be represented by an R, and the widow's peak will be represented by a W. The mother and the father are heterozygous for both traits in this example, so big R little r and big W little w for both of them. I'm going to fill out the Punnett square and give you the four possible phenotypes. The child has a 9 and 16th chance of being able to roll their tongue and have a widow's peak, the child has a 3 and 16th chance of being able to roll their tongue and have a straight hairline, the child has a 3 and 16th chance of not being able to roll their tongue and having a widow's peak, and the child has a 1 and 16th chance of not being able to roll their tongue and having a straight hairline. The next pattern of inheritance is incomplete dominance. This is when a heterozygous genotype expresses a phenotype that falls between the two homozygous extremes. For example, the genotype for a red flower's CR is incompletely dominant over white flower's CW. This will create three possible phenotypes, red, white, and pink. Let's say both parents express pink flowers, which mean they are heterozygous, CRCW, CRCW. I'll fill out this Punnett square. The offspring has a 25% chance of being a red flower, a 50% chance of being a pink flower, and a 25% chance of being a white flower. The next pattern of inheritance is multiple alleles and co-dominance. 
In this example, I'll be talking about the blood types. There are three genes determining the trait of the ABO blood type. The A allele is represented by big IA, the B allele is represented by big IB, and the O allele is represented by little i. This will result to multiple genotypes and expressed phenotypes for this one trait. The reason why codominance is mentioned is because people can have type AB blood. That means both alleles get expressed instead of one over the other. This doesn't apply to type O blood. The A and B alleles are dominant to the O allele. The O allele is always recessive. The last pattern of inheritance is sex-linked inheritance. In the human karyotype, the pattern of X and Y sex chromosomes are not truly homologous to each other. A karyotype is the number and appearance of chromosomes in the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell. We humans are eukaryotes. Since the X chromosome is considerably longer than the Y, the X chromosome carries certain genes that are not represented on the Y chromosome. Therefore, the XX female genotype can carry the typical two alleles for a trait, but the XY male genotype can only carry one allele. Sex-linked inheritance is a pattern in which recessive alleles show up more often in males than females. If a woman inherits a normal gene from a parent and a defective gene from the other, she is considered a carrier for a particular trait. The woman usually don't express the recessive gene, but she can pass it on to her offspring. Basically, these traits are carried on the X chromosome. Women have two and men only have one, which often leads to men expressing these traits more than women. In this example, the mother is a carrier of hemophilia. Her genotype is X big H, X little h. Hemophilia is when your blood doesn't clot normally because it lacks sufficient blood clotting proteins. The father has normal blood clotting. His genotype is X big H, Y. I fill out this Punnett square. The sons have a 50% chance of expressing hemophilia, and the daughters have a 0% chance of expressing hemophilia. The only time when both the daughters and the sons have a 50% chance of expressing these traits is when the mother is a carrier and the father already expressed the trait. So with this being said, should we practice eugenics through controlled breeding? Yes, but it shouldn't be forced on people. Today, with consent, you can have a genetic test to see if you have a probability of passing on a disease to a child. If the chances are high and the disease is life-threatening, you can choose to adopt a child instead. That is eugenics today. Eugenics is really limited because its limits are what we currently have available within the human species. Genome editing is another story. Genome editing is a type of genetic engineering in which DNA is inserted, deleted, or replaced in the genome of an organism using engineered nucleuses or molecular scissors. With genome editing, we can enhance the human species. Heck, we can enhance any species we can think of. When it comes to genome editing, there's no doubt in my mind that we should pursue this. We are discovering disease-causing mutations, and if we can somehow stop them, we can live longer and healthier. Health issues wouldn't be a problem. I believe this is the next step in medicine, eradicating diseases as close to the source as possible. There's nothing objectively wrong with that. Then again, there's nothing objectively right about it either. <laughs> what I mean is that most of us would agree to wanting to live longer and healthier. We've been doing this all along. This way of healing people happens to be more efficient. Why stop there? Why not alter the genotype of humans to create intelligent humans? Is that really as simple as it sounds? This is me speculating, but the human brain seems to have a sense of interdependence. Can we really change one aspect of it and expect everything else to remain the same? Could making highly intelligent humans cause an unforeseeable adverse effect? For example, will we experience severe psychological problems? I truly don't think we can change one aspect of our brain and expect everything else to remain the same. If we're going to alter the cognitive abilities of humans, I would suggest that people should use caution. Let's say there weren't adverse effects. These highly intelligent humans would be considered a new subspecies. The way they would think and behave would be beyond our comprehension. It would be no different from a chimpanzee being oblivious to the culture and civilization we've created. The symbols they would use and the ways they would communicate with each other would be truly fascinating. I also can't help but think they might take on a different physical appearance over time. Would these beings value intelligence so much to the point that they will rely on technology more than their physical bodies? 
I know this is sci-fi territory, but it's fun to imagine the endless possibilities. Will we one day be fragile beings who rely on exosuits to protect our fragile bodies? It's possible. We are becoming less active on average. Gone are the days when we needed to rely on our physical bodies for transport. Now we have faster and efficient machines to help us get to locations we want or need to be. Much faster and efficient than our vehicles and planes. I'm quite sure that race will be brought up, but I currently don't see a reason to use genome editing with race and mind, unless we found proof of differences that exist beyond just physical differences, for example, cognitive abilities. If there are no adverse effects from enhancing the cognitive abilities of humans, we should do this without discriminating based on race. As much as I would like to say every human will be genetically enhanced, I don't think it will happen at first. When we are able to alter the DNA of humans, I expect rich people to be the first ones to genetically enhance themselves before everyone else. As the technology becomes more efficient and the procedure becomes less expensive after its public introduction, I expect more of the general public to be able to afford this procedure and enhance their cognitive abilities and eliminate life-threatening diseases. While eradicating diseases and finding ways to make humans live seemingly forever sounds appealing and I have no problem with that, there are things genome editing can be used for that I wouldn't like. Things that are superficial and unethical ways, as in altering the appearance of a child, but if you want to alter your appearance, I don't see a problem with that. Designing your child to be how you want it to be is unethical. Altering appearance and possibly character traits. I expect this to be done while the fetus is in the womb developing. I believe this is highly unethical. Of course, some people will say, if you're okay with aborting a fetus without their permission, then you should be okay with altering your child's appearance and behavior without their permission. The problem with this argument is that a mother might not want to give birth to a child she won't be able to take care of. Why give birth to a child in possible terrible living conditions or if you know you can't take care of the child just yet? Also, a fetus isn't alive. It's completely dependent on the mother while a designed fetus will potentially live. I believe a woman should have the right to do whatever she wants with her body, but designing a child robs that child of their original independent thought. If the child wants to alter their appearance, let them make that choice themselves. Don't live your life through them. You already have yours. Let them have theirs. What about transgender people? As of now, a complete biological sex change can't happen. We can change some aspects of our biology, but not entirely. If we have the technology to completely change the sex of someone who was born with a mixed match of male body with a female gender, should we change the sex of the person to match the female gender, or should we alter the gender to match the sex? It depends on the person, really. That's something we should let the person to decide on which sex they want to be or what innate gender they want to identify as. I know genome editing works on the genetic level, but we can alter the phenotype of a human. We already do that now with sex reassignment surgery and plastic surgery, but I'm quite sure we'll have more efficient ways of altering the physical appearance of humans by the time we can alter the genotype of humans. I'm quite sure some people might choose to be in between the two sexes. I see no reason to stick to the dichotomy of sex. Some people are going to want a female body with a penis or a male body with a vagina. I see no reason to stop them other than personal reasons. They should have the freedom to live their life how they want, even if the person doesn't have gender dysphoria. If a transgender person does have gender dysphoria, genome editing or a more advanced sex change can easily replace our current treatments. Usually I'd caution people from transitioning on a whim, but in this case, we'd be able to alter the psychological aspect with genome editing. This is of course under the assumption that there are no adverse effects. One thing I'm sure of is that altering your innate gender will alter your behavior in some way. I argue that this technology should be used to help humans, not for unethical reasons. We should not allow advancement in technology to come at the expense of our humanity. So yes, we should practice genome editing to help humans and other species, remove diseases and help us live healthier and longer lives. I see nothing wrong with that. Who will want to live with a deadly disease or be born with abnormal physical conditions? A parent altering the appearance and behavior of their child is unethical. Altering the cognitive abilities of humans and altering your innate gender is something I would support as long as there aren't any adverse effects to it. Anyways, thanks for watching and take care.